How do we show consideration for people in our communities that are trying to avoid alcohol? That is not the topic of our passage today, which is about food sacrifice to idols. However, what I'd like to suggest is that this text may have some application to drinking as well. To make my case, I'll walk you through the original context, and then you can decide if and how this scripture reading might apply to issues today. If you want to follow along in your Bible, our passage today is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8. Corinth is a city in modern-day Greece, which has been rebuilt multiple times through its nearly 6,000 years of history. When Paul first came to Corinth, it had most recently been rebuilt as a colony of the Roman Empire. According to Acts chapter 18, Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth teaching people about Jesus. After helping establish a church in Corinth, Paul moves on to other cities, but he keeps in touch with the new Christians there, which is how he learns that there's some real problems in the church. One of these problems is described in our passage. Paul begins chapter 8 by writing, Now about food sacrifice to idols. If this was an email, that would be the subject line. Someone in the church has told Paul there's a dispute going on, and he's rolled up his sleeves, ready to weigh in. To understand this dispute, we need to understand the context. Today, we use idol to refer to pop stars that fans admire. For example, the title of the TV show's American Idol or Canadian Idol plays in this meaning. But in the older sense, an idol is a painted or carved image that represents a god. Ancient Greeks and Romans worshipped many different gods, and so there are many different idols found in homes, temples, and other public spaces. Often, people would worship a god by offering meat to be sacrificed to the idol representing that god. These sacrifices were often performed in temples and then followed by a feast where friends and family could eat the cooked meat. And back then, as it is these days, meat was expensive. So regardless of your religious devotion, going to a feast like this was a great way to fill your belly and make connections with people wealthy enough to afford meat. But if you were a Jew or a convert to Judaism or a Jewish Christian, this was not okay. One of the core truths of Judaism is that there is only one God, the Shema, a Jewish prayer that is still recited to this day, states, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You may recall that when Gentiles or non-Jews began following Jesus, there was some controversy over whether they had to follow Jewish customs. In Acts 15, this is before Paul goes to Corinth, there's a council in Jerusalem to decide this question. The council's answer was no. There's no need for Gentiles to be circumcised, to follow food laws, or to observe Sabbath. However, one of the few things the council said Gentiles should do is abstain from this food that had been sacrificed to idols. It's in this context, there's a sharp contrast between the Greco-Roman religious practices of the day and the clear instructions from Jewish Christian leaders that Paul is writing the Corinthians. And as he writes, he has a choice to make. Paul could just repeat the council's decision, which they've almost certainly heard before. Don't eat food sacrificed to idols. Alternatively, he could leave it. He could endorse what the Corinthians appear to be saying. Yeah, idols aren't real. Eating idol food doesn't matter. Go right ahead. Paul does neither of these things. His approach is more subtle because he knows the Corinthians are smart, or at least they think they're smart. In the first verse of the chapter, we read the phrase, we all possess knowledge. Modern translations put these words in quotes because Paul is quoting something the Corinthians have said. He does this repeatedly throughout the letter. He quotes a catchphrase from the Corinthians, and then he challenges it. A good way to capture this back and forth is to read the quotes sarcastically. 
For example, yeah, we know that all of us possess knowledge. That's the Corinthian position. How does Paul respond? He writes, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. This is very true. I love learning and studying. I think pursuing knowledge and sharing it with others is a great and noble task for everyone. But there's always a temptation as you learn to become arrogant and boastful and then to condescend to others and humiliate them for not knowing what you know. Certainly, I have indulged this temptation at times. And it doesn't build other people up the way that love should. And that's Paul's question for the Corinthians. Is your knowledge building people up or just puffing you up? We see Paul engage in similar quoting and questioning throughout the rest of the letter. Read verse 4 and add a little sarcasm. We know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Strictly speaking, this is true, but Paul is concerned with how they're using these statements. Yes, if there is only one God, then idols which represent other gods are meaningless. And Paul basically agrees. As the passage goes on, he writes, there may be many so-called gods. People claim there are, in fact, many gods and many lords. You can add some sarcasm here. But for us, there's just one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. Put another way, he's saying, don't get caught up in the gods of your neighbors. Focus on Jesus. But if idols are meaningless, does that mean that eating food sacrificed to them is fine? That's the argument the Corinthians were making. But Paul was a Jew, and I suspect he still had concerns about eating idol food. He doesn't just say that, though, because he knows the Corinthians are proud of how smart they are. Instead, he tries to craft an argument that will get past their pride. You know idols are meaningless? Great. You're proud of how your strong faith allows you to eat this food? Okay. But how are you looking out for your supposedly weaker siblings in Christ? Paul raises this question in verse 10. Note the words, possess knowledge, which we saw in quotes earlier, should be sarcastic. He says, if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols themselves? Paul then slams his point home. By your knowledge, these weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. Put another way, he's saying that their pride and their ability to freely eat food sacrificed to idols is destroying something absolutely priceless, the faith of someone who Jesus died for. And that's why Paul ends the chapter with his own position. If this food is an issue for anyone, I will never eat it. Now, Paul's argument here is subtle, and we can get caught up in it. One challenge, I think, for us is the word weak. When we hear that someone is weak, we can be tempted to think they need to toughen up. Some believers can't handle the fact that others are eating idol food. Tough. That's a them problem. But Paul doesn't say that at all. In chapter 1 of the letter, he said, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. In chapter 2 of the letter, he says he came to the Corinthians in weakness. And in chapter 4 of the letter, he calls himself weak. Paul is on the side of the weak, and he thinks God is too. So when Paul says the weak here, this isn't an insult, and we shouldn't read it as such. For Paul, the weak are the indispensable center of the church. The other challenge of passages like this, which can seem esoteric and obscure for sure, is Is there any application of this teaching today? And if so, what is it? In modern Canada, at least, I believe it's relatively easy to avoid food sacrificed to idols, which is great. Does this text apply to any other issues? Before we start applying it willy-nilly, we need to be careful. For example, some Christians have thought that rock music is immoral. 
others tattoos, others hair dye. Does that mean you can't listen to rock music or get a tattoo or dye your hair or do anything that anyone anywhere disapproves of? I can't claim to have much experience with tattoos. My suspicion, though, is that most people who disapprove of tattoos are not personally inclined to get one. This is not a struggle for them. This is just something they don't want other people doing. Being sober, however, is very different. From what I understand, many people who are sober very much retain the desire to drink alcohol. What makes them sober is that they made a choice, often an extraordinarily difficult choice, not to drink in light of how drinking has hurt them or others in the past. That challenge, wrestling with a desire that could destroy you, reminds me of this passage. Paul doesn't tell the Corinthians to avoid eating idol meat because some people don't like it. His concerns at the end of our chapter are wounding their consciences, causing people to fall and destroying believers by encouraging them to eat this meat. The stakes here are far higher than just offending. And turning back to alcohol then, is it okay for Christians to drink alcohol in moderation? Sure. But some of our siblings in Christ are trying very hard not to drink. And given this passage, I think we should be considerate of how we approach alcohol as a community. At St. Clement's, the priests make a point of saying you can receive communion by receiving the bread and simply touching the cup without drinking from it. They also invite people to receive a blessing or to say a prayer of spiritual communion if they're watching online. All of this sends a clear message. You can belong here, you can fully participate without a drop of wine touching your lips. I like that approach. I think it's worth imitating. And so my challenge for all of us is, how do we bring that spirit into the rest of our lives? There's some easy practical ideas, making good non-alcoholic drink options when we host a party, or keeping track of who doesn't drink so we don't offer them alcohol repeatedly or by accident. But I think what matters most of all is our attitude. Are we puffed up about our knowledge that Anglicans have never been teetotalers, that Anglicans can and do drink? Or are we trying to build up our neighbors who may have very varied, varied experiences with alcohol? Because it's this latter attitude, I suggest, that is love. Amen.